When I searched online, I found a great deal of interesting facts and information about the Philippine Church celebrating its 500 years of Christianity. Yes, other than online searches, one can learn more about the vibrant Philippine Church and its faith journey. Hi, I'm J.D. Marr. Welcome to Shalom World's 500 YOC program in partnership with the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines. In this series, we dive deep into 500 years of Christianity, its roots, journey, and fruits in the world's third largest Catholic country, the Philippines. In the 16th century, explorer Ferdinand Magellan and his team of voyagers from Europe reached the island of Cebu to expand their spice trade. This has been marked as a milestone in the history of the country and its people. The Christian missionaries who accompanied Magellan on the Spanish ship spread the gospel in the Philippines. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount that those who long for justice will receive the same. Jesus always stood for the justice of humankind. This is Cardinal Sin speaking to the people in Metro Manila. When Cardinal Jaime Sin made a one-minute radio message seeking the support of the people for a peaceful protest, it was well received and acted upon by the Filipinos. The influence of the Catholic Church on the people of the Philippines was tremendous. The Church supported the protest of the people who fought for democracy and for freedom from the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos in the 1980s. The Filipinos eliminated the brutal rule from their land by receiving the soldiers with flowers and by surrendering themselves before the battle tanks with rosaries in hand. The world witnessed a peaceful and gentle protest in which thousands of people joined together. When we are celebrating the 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines, it is very important to discuss Cardinal Jaime Sin and the protest where the church and the community stood together for justice, EDSA, 1986. This reminds each Christian that it is our duty to be faithful in Christ and to stand with those who long for justice as well. Today, we have Father Albert Alejo, SJ, and Attorney Joe Arreo Imbong to learn more in a discussion about the pivotal time in Philippine history. Father Albert Alejo is a Jesuit priest, poet, social anthropologist, and activist. He completed his PhD in social anthropology from the University of London. He is presently a member of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. The work of the Potting Bird highlights his engagement in cultural analysis, good governance, interreligious dialogue, indigenous people's movement, and the crafting of poetry, contextual philosophy, and theology. His current research interests touch on the unsilent stones of Bontoc Bishop Francisco Claver S.J., popular religiosity, and whistleblowing in the Moriones Holy Week celebration, the Catholic Church Sanctuary Ministry, and Pope Francis's teaching on political charity. Attorney Jo Imbong is a university counsel and lecturer of the University of Asia and the Pacific. She is a faculty member of the Ateneo de Manila University, a practicing lawyer in family rights and media law at the forefront of family rights advocacy in the Philippines. She is a church volunteer heading the legal office of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, where she coordinates a network of pro-life organizations nationwide. An allied attorney of the Alliance Defense Fund, she organized the St. Thomas More Society in the Philippines, an organization of Christian lawyers in defense of family rights, religious freedom, and traditional values. Among public interest lawsuits 
the organization initiated are a taxpayer's suit against the Secretary of Education to stop school-based sex education and a criminal complaint against the Cultural Center of the Philippines before the office of the Ombudsman for the crime of offense against religion. All right, we'll start with uh, Father Albert. Uh, who's actually, uh, we're speaking to him in Rome today, so we're so glad that you're with us. First of all, uh, we both study history, especially Catholic history and the history of the church, and and there have been uh, times during the church history where it has taken brave steps, specifically to safeguard those values of, say, a democratic society, when they can. Uh, the Philippines is, has been a beneficiary of these courageous steps. Um, you and I both know that. So when we look at the 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines, from say the Spanish regime to modern times, what would you say that how the church has shown itself to be a defender of specifically the rights, the, the, the rights of the Filipino people? That's a lot of time, 500 years. And uh, we cannot generalize uh, too much. As a human institution, the church is composed of individuals and groups and in this case, uh, you have missionaries, you have lay people, you have bishops, you know, like any human institution, there's plus and there's minus. Some people would say the church came to the Philippines riding on the boat of colonialism. In a way, that's true. That is very true. Uh, but how else can you come here? At the same time, you also have missionaries, especially in the beginning. They were the scientists, the linguists. They collated the dictionaries that and right now we benefit from the records. And to some extent, you know, the church was uh, an instrument of colonialism, but you also have missionaries and pastoral workers who were against colonialism, who were protective of, of the people. You know? So um, if I look, at um, the history of the church in the Philippines, I celebrate the coming of the church because the church brought Jesus Christ. The church brought a good story, the story of creation, the story of salvation. At the same time, I also feel regret for the times that there were abuses. But uh, until now, it's still the same story. We are part of maintaining institutions that somehow are not able to lift up the poor, but we are, I'm also part of the institution, which has a long history of humanitarian work, of compassion, of service. And we see that in different uh, episodes in our history. No, I, I, I totally understand that. We can't just always use rose-colored glasses. We have to We have to look at the full picture. I, I completely get that. Okay, uh, Attorney Joe, as you're affectionately known in the Philippines, uh, let's talk about the ways that the church has shown itself to be a defender of the rights of the Filipinos, especially now concerning children. How would you tackle that? When we speak of Christians or Catholics, we are citizens of two domains, the spiritual domain, but also of the temporal domain. It means, the laws of the land cover us. And as we respect the laws of the land, we also act according to the tenets of our faith. All through those years, the church has been a very strong advocate of um, moral, social uh, good. And the church and the state rather has protected church to speak out on issues that border on faith and the uh, uh, morality. The case of uh, the Diocese of Bacolod versus the Commission on Elections, a 2015 case is uh, in point. There, in that landmark decision, Justice Marvick Leonen defended the right of the church to speak out on political issues. It is not religious speech. It's a political speech because it touches on the basic rights of the citizens. And I would like to point out that in that case of uh, the Diocese of Bacolod, it was represented by the bishop himself. Not only that, the bishop himself entered it as a co-petitioner in his personal capacity, imagine. And the decision was really something that protects the right of the church to speak out on current issues. 
You've been involved in working for the social causes of the church uh, most of your life, particularly through your pro-life advocacy. I want to talk about the challenges faced again by the church in the Philippines and your advocacy for the sanctity of life. Let's dive a little deeper into that. What, what are those challenges? There are really challenges because uh, there is a misunderstanding of the meaning of separation of church and state. But it is more of a free exercise of religion. Uh, this free exercise clause covers two points, you know, the right to believe, and the second is the right to practice one's belief. On the second, the state cannot uh, control that, cannot prevent that. The church's voice will always be heard because it is its duty of the bishops to point out when there is a breach of ethical, moral issues. It is their moral obligation. They cannot be silent. And so with the faithful. So the challenge here is the misunderstanding and the questions that arise like, uh, is the church intruding on political grounds when it speaks about political issues? No, because the the things that uh, the basic rights advocated by the state in the constitution and the basic rights advocated by the church coincide. Let me give you an example. The right to life, it is entrenched in our constitution and it is one of the doctrines of the church. Um, protection of marriage as the basis of foundation, basic foundation of society. So we cannot say that, look, it is beyond your realm. It is not, it is a convergence of responsibility. And then when you look at the church's hierarchy, you have to look at the, the courage, the courageousness of Cardinal Jaime Sin. He played a significant role in the nonviolent EDSA revolution in the 80s. I remember as a young man, all of us in the United States, watching this unfold on television and just spellbound. Just for a moment, maybe, if we can go back, give us a little background about the church's involvement in that EDSA revolution, if you will. I was in second year high school, but I was already joining a protest movement. <laughs> and then uh, it, it was a buildup of uh, torture and violence, but there were also good indoctrination among the people. So we just had to live with that for two decades. But later on, it was really becoming more and more uh, oppressive. My father, for example, lost his job because uh, I think the steel mills had to close down because of uh, the, some corruption. Okay, So many people lost jobs. That's why, you know, I'm here in Rome. The story of the diaspora of the Filipinos uh, started during martial law when they were oppressing and suppressing trade unions. So the, the workers either stayed home uh, as vendors or tried exploring work outside of the Philippines. I wrote a book, I published a book of poetry in Tagalog and a collection of poems really was uh, a product of my experiences, the, the things that I witnessed during martial law days. In all these years, um, many sisters, and lay people and uh, priests and a few bishops really fought for justice to the extent that some of them went a far farther left. <laughs> okay, but it's it's because uh, Marcos, the dictator, really divided the country, and so I witnessed I witnessed the many sacrifices of Christians. Mm. They were tortured, they were killed. Of course, some of them left the, the priesthood and the convent. Some of them took arms. But most of us really uh, just stuck to the evangelical gospels. I remember in our retreats, for example, Luke chapter 4, you know, the declaration of Jesus saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor. That really was um, an eye-opener for many of us. Many of the church people would give a try. We'd you know, give a chance to martial law. But towards the end, uh, we could not stand it. Uh, we just had to, to face the tanks and the armalites of 
of Marcelon. And Cardinal Sin was a good voice, a prophetic voice. But uh, he had a way of uh, protecting the church, protecting the people, listening to the people. And at that very moment, he had that instinct. I think it was inspired that he knew what to say to the people and the people responded. It, uh, it's, it was a work, not just of Cardinal Sin, but of so many people, so many NGOs, so many community organizers, so many retreats, which were different in tone and in spirit. The emotion runs deep. You can, you can hear it in your voice. It, it never goes away. It probably will always be with you as long as you live. I, I feel that. Um, would it have happened without the church? Would ETSA have happened in that revolution? Would it have, have been so strong, so prominent, and had the results that it had and helped solidify um, perhaps the church's prominence? I mean, did the church, did it actually help itself infuse and promote that cause with the Catholic church in the Philippines? Again, would it have happened without the church? The reality is the church with its instrumentalities, the Catholic schools, Radio Veritas, the, the radio uh, station, just kept on you know, communicating to the people what was happening because it was the alternative media. And we also have leaflets, you know, because the martial law controlled the television, the traditional and mainstream radio stations. And so it was the church that uh, provided alternative uh, communication lines to reveal what exactly was happening, if there is a massacre there, if there is a killing here, if there's suppression here, if there is demolition of uh, shanties in that other city. We can say that the church played a very important role. Maybe we can say there was no other. There was no other institution capable of mounting that kind of movement. But how may we walk? Salam alaikum. Just me, I. Udo, very good. Tanti pa, you got time. Pa, muhay suwo. Sumay yung kapayapaan. Ayo le niyo. Peace be with you. Mbone chinubo. Mbule wone ti. Yo ni ting at. Suno he walk. Salam alaikum. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Shalom World Asia Africa. Bringing stories of faith, mission and missionary experiences, chronicles of hope in the midst of pain and suffering. A faith that thrives in the midst of persecution from the exuberant and vibrant church of Asia and Africa. Shalom World, now for over five billion people of the Asian and African continent. We bring you complete joy in being of one love and one mind in Jesus' name. Shalom. 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 Shalom World Asia Africa, launching March 25th 2022. Let's talk now about the church's opposition. We, we know that the church in the Philippines opposes the reproductive health bill. You're familiar with this. And of course, the recent rash of killings related to the war on drugs, it's affected the church relationship with the government. Let's touch on that for a moment. Let's talk about that, that connection between the church's relationship, again, with the government in light, specifically, of this reproductive health bill. The reproductive health bill was uh, uh, challenged when it was still being discussed in the lower house in Congress. And uh, the Catholic faithful, through their uh, movements and advocacy, cannot be faulted for being uh, indifferent. No, the, the, the opposition 
to some of its provisions. We, we, the church um, values human life. And with that as the basic um, standard and foundation, anything that uh, goes against the right to life is anathema. That is why, that is why the case of Imbong versus uh, uh, Honorable Ochoa was brought together with 13 other petitions. Uh, by the way, JD, in, in those 13 um, petitions together with the Imbong case, one petition with two petitioners were not Catholics. They were non-Catholics and they cleaved to the doctrine of the right to life. So it is not just a Catholic position, it's a religious uh, uh, um, truth, which whatever faith, you know, life is the ultimate. So there's a duty to oppose whatever challenges the right to life. When the Supreme Court uh, finally uh, re released its uh, judgment, no? finding, uh, upholding the reproductive health bill, making it a law, it struck down several provisions which transgress on faithful's uh, right to conscientious objection. That is a big triumph already. Uh, as you both know, this episode is titled Faith That Does Justice. And we're highlighting the intimate relationship between the Christian beliefs and the promotion of social justice. Uh, Father Alejo, um, talk about what other areas of social life that have been involved with the church and, and the Philippines and the Filipino people. What programs have the local church initiated specifically? Our exposure programs, uh, seminarians, touched on labor movements in, in the city, in the in Manila area. But in other parts of the country, the exposure programs for the seminarians would be with the peasants, with the, with the farmers. And in other parts of the country, the exposure programs would reach up to the mountains of the indigenous peoples, etc. Now, I mention this because these were formative years. And if you form the seminarians, who after a few years become priests and nuns, <laughs> the, the sisters, they started, or we started working with trade unions, not just with workers in general. We really organized trade unions. And even as a young priest, I said masses, you know, along the streets during strikes. So the church was there at ground zero where things happen, not just in reading, foot, uh, running after footnotes to produce a text, uh, a thesis and dissertations. So when we say church, it's not just the priests or the bishops or the nuns, but lay people offering their lives and praying the rosary, literally, uh, Sometimes leaving the the families you know, uh, in in their attempt to live a life of integrity and uh, passion and energy and 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 sacrifice. So the church was not just inside the parishes. They we were in different social sectors like labor, like farmers, like women like um, the indigenous peoples, the fisher folks, etc. So uh, partly the organizing then was community organizing according to not just geographies, but also uh, sectors. Now, what about the schools? The schools uh, form also part of the platform for communicating ideas to, to the students. Some of the Catholic schools would cater to the rich. We also have converts. <laughs> Even some of these rich people would go down to the level of the urban poor and the fisher folks in terms of uh, exposure programs. So these are favorite uh, terms during the time, exposure programs, immersion, <laughs> conscientization, uh, social catechesis, things like that. No? Moving on now. In other cases, uh, the Philippine church has, has been able to advocate social justice while maintaining, and you've even described that too here, an amicable relationship with the government. Can you, can you pinpoint that a little more? How is that possible? You've talked about church and state. 
And how have they continued that amicable relationship together? It wasn't difficult, I would say, J.D. In the preamble of our Constitution alone, the, fair, the first paragraph starts uh, with, the, with the sentence, the Filipino people imploring the aid of Almighty God. Well, what's Almighty God doing in a political document like the Constitution? But it is there, written by the 1987 Constitutional Convention. Now, this is similar to uh, One Nation Under God, you know, in the Pledge of Allegiance of the United States. Uh, the, the presence of those words uh, were challenged. This was challenged, rather. But in this country, in our Constitution, it has a very significant uh, implication in the preamble. It is saying, it is telling us that there is this convergence of political values and religious values. And Father Albert, finally for you, we have this amazing opportunity now to look back at history, look back at the 500 years of Christianity in the country. So give me your kind of wrap up. How has the church helped transform the Philippine society? You've covered a lot of it, but this is your opportunity to kind of put it all in a nutshell. How would you put that, the church and its transformation of the Philippines and its people? We reaffirm the work of the missionaries, our humanitarian work. In general, we reaffirm the mission of introducing Jesus Christ. Number two, but we regret that although we preach Jesus Christ, we fail to live up to being Christian. <laughs> so we don't apologize for introducing Jesus Christ, but we apologize for not living like Jesus. For the times that we failed to live the Christian life, for the times we, that we were a scandal to the people we wanted to serve. And so there comes number three. Now we are ready to renew ourselves. We are ready to transform our catechesis. We are ready to work more and more with the deprived, with the oppressed. We are ready to work for the renewal of the environment. Now we are ready probably to fail again. <laughs> so, uh, so we continue living a life of uh, mission, but a mis as missionaries, we also are repentant that sometimes we are also an embarrassment to the, to the people we want to, to serve. I hope we don't allow the dark ages that we have experienced to return to us. So let's stick to the gospel, to Jesus Christ, and especially now to the Catholic social teachings of the church. Wonderful insights from both of you. We really appreciate your time, your energy, your, your enthusiasm as uh, we celebrate this time in Philippine history. Thank you both. You know, we've learned a lot about the Filipino people's faith that does justice in Christ. Once again, I wanna thank Father Albert Alejo and attorney Joe Aurea Imbong. Join us again next week for more of the 500 YOC. We want you to download the free Shalom World app to watch the series. You'll get more updates on 500 years of celebrations in the Philippines and many more amazing shows. I'm J.D. Mar, Mabuhay and Shalom. We are blessed. We
Are you searching for purpose of life? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.